Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're about to kick off. Um, so thank you very much all for uh, attending this afternoon. We welcome you to the Stevenson Harwood Compliance Seminar in collaboration with the Dubai International Financial Centre. If I could uh, just have a few moments of your time just to go through a few housekeeping points. Firstly, for, for those people who, don't, who are not aware um, of, or have not been to the DIC Conference Centre uh, before, um, if I could just explain that the washrooms are through the back double doors and to the left. Um, if I could ask um, for everyone to please silence their mobile phones, um, we will be having um, a live feed which I will just be uh, speaking to you about uh, very shortly, um, and so that would uh, minimise interrupt uh, interruption um, on that live feed, so I'd appreciate uh, if everyone could please silence their phones. In terms of um, the live stream, there's a link which we have sent out um, to uh, participants, um, so people who are unable to attend uh, this afternoon here at the DIFC, they will be joining us uh, via web link. Um, you will also note that uh, you have each uh, received <coughs> an iPad on your chair. Um, unfortunately, these are not for you to take home with you. Um, these are purely for um, today's um, seminar. Um, so if I could kindly ask you all to please leave them on your seats once uh, the seminar has uh, ended. Um, as you can see from the uh, screen, uh, screenshot, there's no need to register. You've all been pre-registered uh, with your email addresses that were used um, for the purposes of registration for this event. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to just thank our event sponsors. Firstly, Thomson Reuters, who are providing the live feed um, today um, through the web uh, link. Uh, to the Oath magazine, who are covering um, this event uh, in their publication. And to Eventpad, who are the uh, suppliers um, of all these iPads uh, that are before you today. Um, in terms of the participants, I would like to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of the panelists uh, today whom I will be introducing uh, shortly. Firstly, a thank you to the Dubai Financial Services Authority, uh, the Abraj Group, Paul Karma, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and Total Solutions. In terms of your iPads, if I could just explain we aren't going to be having a formal question and answer session uh, during the course of these proceedings. What we will have is an option for each and every one of you to send through a question via your iPad. Now if you look at your, if I could ask each and every one of you to pick up your iPad so I can just explain to you where these are. There is a um, question mark on the top right hand corner which allows you to toggle um, to keep yourself anonymous if you wish to do so and it allows you to type in a question which would then be sent to me um, and I will then put that question to the audience uh, uh, to the uh, panel um, at the appropriate time. Uh, in terms of other features on the iPad, um, we have various features. If you look at the bottom uh, toolbar, you'll, you'll have uh, various uh, options that you can click onto. You have the program, you'll have the speaker's biographies, have a bit more information about Stevenson Harwood, a bit more information about the DIFC, uh, our supporters and the sponsors of the event, and a feedback form which we would be grateful if you could fill in at the end of this session. Without any further ado, I'd like to call upon Dr. Ashraf Gamaluddin, who is the CEO of Holkama, to give us a brief welcome address. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the DIFC. Uh, I'd like to thank Stevenson Harold for uh, uh, this event uh, and all the partners. Um, my name is Ashraf Gamal. I'm the CEO of Haukama. Haukama is, is a company working for good governance owned by the DIFC, so in fact we are part of the DIFC, and, and that's why um, I'm here now. Um, what we are doing is we are working with companies and uh, governments of the region so that we can improve corporate governance practices uh, by helping companies, advising them and supplying them with lots of services. Um, and there are publications outside about uh, how come and, and uh, 
journalistic articles and studies that we have conducted before in the region. Um, now, this, this in, e event is important, uh, or we think it's really very important and valuable for us because we uh, perceive regulation and, and uh, regulators as ways in which we protect companies and investments and stakeholder rights. Uh, I know that many companies would look at regulators as some sort of uh, bodies which are trying to enforce certain rules and that's it. But in fact, the essence that we look at it is really protection for companies and for shareholders and other stakeholders, as well as management uh, itself. Um, it's also a way to create more value for companies. Uh, regulation does help companies so that they can be streamlined in, in, on the right track so that they can add value to their own uh, constituents and stakeholders. Uh, of course, there are challenges that companies face, especially operating from, from Dubai or in this region, that they operate under different jurisdictions under which they have different regulation. Uh, and that poses some risks for companies which are not fully aware of differences between regulations in countries of, of the region. <coughs> uh, now, compliance is one of the key functions of corporate governance. Uh, corporate governance, as, as you all know, of course, is defined that it's a system by which companies are directed and controlled. Now, usually we focus on the control side of that, and, and we don't look at the uh, direction side or the strategy setting side and the future orientation side, but still, uh, compliance is really a key part of, of this. And of course, internal audit is, is also an important part of that. Now, what we have seen from our experience is that there is a big mix up between the two of them. So there is lack of understanding where does you know internal audit stops and compliance starts and so on. So I think today's event is an important uh, uh, forum so that we can uh, highlight the differences there. Um, now, we have seen a trend of outsourcing uh, compliance function and, of course, internal as well to outside companies, uh, which is uh, very useful for smaller companies who cannot afford to have these functions internally. However, there are risks associated with that. So we would have to ask ourselves when we outsource, do we outsource responsibility and accountability as well or not? If problems happen, who is responsible? And how does the company manage that risk in a way that will maximize the value and and prevents problems from happening in the company. Now, of course, the concept of entry uh, AML uh, is, is coming back again. We have seen uh, in the last couple of weeks some, some big uh, scandals happening uh, around that. So again, we thought that the systems are in place to prevent AML or at least control it. But now we see that this is actually surfacing again. So again, that's something that, that's going to be, uh, I think, covered today in today's event. Now, the final uh, thing I'd like to say is, from our experience and from what's happening around us, we can truly say that corporate governance and compliance is not a function, it's really the culture. It's about ethics in the company itself. It's not really about some sets of rules and somebody who's sitting in the room in charge of compliance or governance. It's about the culture of the company, and that's something that we are trying to promote. It's not about having a code of corporate governance, really believing in it and acting upon that. Um, again, once more, I welcome you all to the DIC. I hope this will be a very useful uh, event for all of us, and uh, I, I hope that we will benefit from the experiences of the speakers as well as yourselves. Uh, thank you, and uh, good luck in the event. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. If I can now um, introduce to the audience, the panelists that we have uh, this afternoon. Firstly, if I could welcome Mr. Lawrence Paramasivam, Director, Conduct of Business for the Dubai Financial Services Authority. Lawrence joined the DFSA in 2007 and was appointed as Director, Conduct of Business in the Supervision Division in September 2014. He is responsible for the supervision of conduct of business risks, including AML, CFT, trans sanctions risks, for the DFSA regulated entities in the DIFC. He leads a team, of respons leads a, leads a team responsible for the supervision sorry, of licensed firms, which includes fund managers, asset managers, investment advisors, and investment managers. He has also practiced in various roles as an in-house in counsel in Australia and the United Kingdom. Secondly, if I could welcome Peter Brady, who is the Group Chief Compliance Officer of the Abraj Group. Peter has 25 years' experience in legal and compliance-related matters. 
Before joining the Abrage Group, Peter was the head of compliance for UBS in the MENA region, and previous to that, he was a head of compliance at Emirates Bank. He obtained his legal and compliance experience whilst working in various positions in the UK and Australia. Our next panelist is Yuri De Vries, managing partner of Total Solutions. Throughout his 18 years banking career within ING Bank, Yuri built up strong first-hand expertise in wholesale securities, structured finance, and tax leverage leasing, international commercial banking, retail domestic banking, and payment and cash management. He's active in the Dutch interbank community as he was a chairman of the advisory board to Interpay. In 2008, Yuri became the managing partner of Total Solutions Middle East, where he used his vast international banking experience and network to build Total Solutions Middle East into a leading compliance and HR-related outsourcing and consultancy firm in the DIFC. Lastly, as our panel member, John Wilkinson, senior forensic partner from PricewaterhouseCoopers. He's, uh, John is Middle East deals with Middle East regional deals. Lead, he's a leader in Middle East regional deals and a member of the PwC executive management team in the Middle East and a senior forensic services partner in the Middle East region based in the UAE. He specialises in forensic accounting analysis for both criminal matters and civil disputes in the investigation, detection and prevention of fraud and bribery and corruption and in the provision of expert witness reporting and testimony. John has experience of forensic accounting and of preventing and investigating economic crime which stretches back over 22 years, including construction claims, claims for loss of profits due to the contractual breaches, bribery and corruption, false accounting and financial misrepresentation, procurement fraud, securities and banking fraud, asset misappropriation, purchase price determinations, and in conducting forensic due diligence work, both pre and post acquisition. We're also delighted to have with us this uh, evening Tony Woodcock, who is our regulatory partner from Stevenson Harwood from our London office. Tony has consistently been cited as a leading individual for his work in this field by Chambers since the mid-1990s. He has advised individuals and entities who are investigated by or giving assistance to the financial services and prosecuting authorities both in the UK and abroad, including the FCA, the PRA, the SFO, the CMA in the UK, the Department of Justice, the FBI, the SEC and the CFTC in the US. He is a solicitor advocate and appears as an advocate before the FCA's Regulatory Decisions Committee. Tony also sits as a Deputy District Judge in criminal cases. If I can, before passing over to Tony, please ask everyone to uh, pick up their iPads and we will have the first question uh, of this evening to the audience. So the question is, what are the biggest challenges faced by compliance officers to date? Is it A, increasing complexi complexity of regulatory ob obligations, B, insufficient buy-in from senior management, C, ability to hire qualified or experienced compliance personnel, or is it D, increasing risk of regulatory sanctions or censure? If I could ask everyone to please vote now. Okay, I hope everyone's pressed the button and the desired selection. So we have the results, Tony. I'll pass over to you. Yes, I don't um, uh, find that actually a um, particularly surprising uh, result. Uh, I come from the background of, of the UK, as you've heard. I think a UK compliance audience and CEO audience will also say that uh, the global, which is more global now than ever before, regulatory structure not just looking at what the rules tell you in your own jurisdiction but how they marry up with various other jurisdictions because the whole financial services industry is a good deal more global now than ever it was before. Um, and even matching up, as I say, more of the various you know, requirements, um, negotiating uh, oneself through what I often describe as a kind of financial services bar for wire on which anyone can very um, uh, easily get snagged uh, with um, enormous um, penalties. So I'm not surprised, as I say, by that uh, as, as a result. I'm um, more surprised, I have to say, by the notion that 
26% who fear that there is insufficient uh, buy-in from senior management. Um, one would have thought that having regard, certainly in the UK, over the last 10 years, and I suspect elsewhere, particularly the US, the um, uh, swinging penalties um, imposed on companies for regulatory breaches um, would have brought managers, uh, senior managers, up um, short in quite a, in, 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 in quite a um, shock. So I do find that um, uh, surprising. Um, the ability to hire qualified, experienced, compliance personnel um, didn't surprise me at all. Um, there were, was a day when I first started uh, in compliance practice where compliance was very much the back room for a girl. Um, something you gave someone to do when you couldn't think of anything else. The scene has changed just enormously. Um, it is a hugely complex um, area um, and people, um, compliance officers, are like gold dust in the market and you have to pay gold dust to recruit uh, and retain um, individuals of um, quality. Um, increasing risk uh, of regulatory sanctions and censure. Um, uh, it, it should never be the case, uh, it seems to me, that people are um, driven into compliant action by, in, in this compliant conduct, by the threat of, um, uh, of, of, of penalty. So I'm a bit surprised to see the statistic there um, as high as it is. I don't know if any of my panel members have any further comments to make agreement or disagreement on on one point. Um, yeah, I, I definitely uh, agree that the increasing complexity of regulatory uh, obligations is a, is a real challenge. Um, I, I described uh, 2014 as the year of the acronyms. Uh, there's so many legislation coming through, whether it's back the uh, AIFM directive um, um, and, and so many others. And as a result, uh, uh, and not just in, the, in, in that area, but in prudential regulations with the Basel III standards and so forth, there, there is quite a lot of regulatory obligations that a compliance officer and, and a firm and their senior management need to uh, get their head around. Oh, it, it, if I may add to that, on the one hand, the increase in complexity is a like, difficult, it's a challenge. It's becoming more and more complex and the rules and rules that raises it. But these things more or less are acting at a global level. I think there's also some good news to report. That's basically that if you look out here on the regional level, you see attempts where certain countries and jurisdictions are trying to harmonize things a little bit more. And then, in my view, both things go hand in hand. You have the global stream of more and more complexity and bigger rules. They will start to apply to all kinds of jurisdictions. So a, a, a regional harmonization is a logical consequence. So on one hand, more difficult, on the other hand, there's good news to go. That's how I feel about it. Um, well, from my perspective, I, I'm a, a little surprised actually at the order in which these came out. Um, I, I would understand the complexity of the obligations as being probably the greatest concern in the room, and, and that came out. Um, I'd have thought that actually the ability to hire qualified and experienced compliance personnel would have been up there um, along with that. Um, certainly um, within our organisation and the clients that we work with, that always comes up as an issue. Um, the availability of talent and resource and the ability to actually train up your compliance function um, is usually uh, very highly available. Uh, I'm also a little bit surprised, uh, as, as Tony mentioned, about that um, the increasing risk of regulatory sanctions being quite so high. Um, one of the things that um, we often ask uh, compliance officers when we when we sit down with them and CEOs of organisations is, in the absence of a regulator, would you be doing anything different? Um, it's an interesting question because most of the time I think the answer would have to be no because many of the things are actually pretty basic and fundamental. The way, the way that they're described in the regulations and the complexity comes in the different different treatments somehow, but, but they all boil down to some fundamental behaviours. Um, I think most organisations um, have started to recognise that and if you apply those fundamentals properly then obviously the risk of, of sanction goes down. The challenge is the sanctions are particularly high or have, been, have become particularly high and that maybe is driving, uh, driving that percentage up. So the fear is increased because 
the sanctions could be increased. And then you would say B and C are basically complementary. Yeah. The higher sanctions, you automatically get more buying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, um, thank you for that. Um, just looking at our general topic, we're going to um, dive down into specific areas, as you have seen on your um, uh, invitations, um, cross-border marketing issues, combat risks, and outsourcing. But our overall theme is whether compliance is a, a hindrance or a support. Um, and hindrance or support is a debate that I've heard in varying uh, degrees of volume, both of sound and of scale over the 20 years or so that I've been um, a regulatory um, lawyer. Um, as I said, I come to this um, uh, uh, from the viewpoint of um, uh, a UK lawyer, but I suspect that some of the themes are common wherever you are operating um, in the globe. And I, I really want to tell you, or give you a history lesson. Um, when I started, um, we had such a thing as light touch regulation. Uh, in the UK to begin with, under the Financial Services Act of 1986, uh, individuals didn't have to be registered. Uh, it was essentially a non-statutory self-regulation scheme which was practitioner-led. Um, enforcement was irregular. Um, rules uh, uh, governed uh, behavior. It was rules-based regulation rather than principles-based regulation. It brought with it uh, a greater degree of predictability for the lawyers and for the um, industry. The industry was less global, the products were less complex, um, the uh, number of regulators were uh, fewer, um, both domestically and globally, and they were a good deal um, less joined up uh, in their activities than they are today. Now let's Fast forward to 2015, um, look at the picture now. I should say, we didn't, um, when I first started, have AML. That wasn't a feature of the compliance scheme at all. It's just horrifying when you think about that now, but that's how it was. Um, fast forward, as I say, to 2015, and those in, uh, from the UK jurisdictions or, um, may well have heard the words of Hector Sands the um, former chief executive of the Financial Services Authority and his notion of coming into office to be afraid of the FSA, be very afraid <coughs> of the FSA. Um, and people were asking, well, what is all that about? Is that really how the regulators should be um, uh, linking with the um, industry? We don't have a light touch anymore in the UK. There is a heavy focus uh, on individuals, uh, and we just imposed in the UK the notion of the senior manager's regime of a reversal of the burden of proof in enforcement matters. It's heavily statute-based, um, and um, uh, regulatory enforcement is frequent. We have a principles-based regulatory system, so obedience to the rules doesn't necessarily win the day. It's not necessarily the end of the story. We have globalization of projects on the way we didn't have before and the complexity of products that we didn't have before. We have a public antipathy to um, the banking industry, it's really fair, I think, probably uh, beyond the UK. Um, regulators in different jurisdictions are working increasingly um, hand in hand, and there are just huge resources that need to be deployed by practitioners in the industry uh, in ensuring that um, compliance uh, is not only done, but is evident. The record keeping, keeping people up to date, keeping the compliance officers up to date, keeping the practitioners within the organization uh, up to date. The cost ultimately, of course, falls on the um, customer. Um, and compliance officers uh, are, these days, not the backroom boys, not the persons that you could not give other jobs to, but are seriously at the sharp end. And in the context of the UK, again, uh, with our new senior managers of the we can expect to see compliance officers under more serious scrutiny by the regulator than we had before. Now, um, some would say, well, scandals have still happened. 
um, and all you've done as regulators is play catch up, and it still isn't working. Um, in the UK, one of the it in fact in the motion with whom we take support, um, we're having to get to grips with um, at the moment with uh, our new um, senior manager regime, which means that those who participate in the management of the banking, the banking, the deposit taking sector, um, to a good extent, um, have to be um, very carefully vetted. If there's a failure uh, in their area of the bank, um, they can be, um, as I've mentioned before, subject to a burden of proof. So if the bank fails, the FCA will be asking the regulator, or the, the, the um, FCA will be asking the uh, registered, the approved individual, um, why did it fail? And the onus is on you to prove to us, the regulator, why it fails. So it's quite a, you know, a horrifying um, prospect. Uh, is it support or is it hindrance? Or well, there's a debate on that big time in the UK at the moment. The one angle, um, the, um, the support uh, will stop crises. Uh, it will um, enhance competence and it will help to restore um, public confidence uh, in a banking industry which has been shattered by scoundrel year upon year upon um, year. Um, is it a hindrance? Well, one of the debates that's also going on in the UK uh, is if you have the uh, rigidity, the rigour of this sort of regime, are you going to deter good people from coming into the industry because um, they do not want to take the personal um, risk? So um, there's lots of issues. That's just addressing sort of my overall view of the hindrance and support um, debate. Um, what we've done, um, after a lot of thought, is really extract some of those um, issues. Uh, and the first that we're going to have a question about uh, is in relation to possible water marketing. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, if I could ask everyone to pick up their uh, iPads again, please. Um, for the second question of this evening. The question is, what are the main challenges to an effective cross-border framework? Is it A, knowledge or understanding of legal or regulatory obligation? Is it B, resourcing? Is it C, management buy-in? Or is it D, effective passporting? Could I please ask everyone to vote now? <laughs> <coughs> yes, I think that's um, uh, pretty much what um, uh, emphasis again of the first um, the, the, the first um, uh, set of answers, and again, thinking of <coughs> things about the audience um, that we need to understand what it is we are supposed to police and implement and. Uh, explain to those who would rather not um, deal with compliance officers and regard them as an interference with the business as to why um, what, we, what we expect them um, to do. Um, and I'm going to hand over to um, Peter to set up what he believes uh, are some of the cross border challenges <coughs> for you. Thank, thanks very much, Tony. Um, in keeping with the whole theme of voting, I'd like to, I'd actually like to see a show of hands from the room as to. Um, how many of you feel that um, cross-border a cross-border framework is relevant to you and, and it is important in, in your organisation? So, if any, anybody put their hand up, and that is relevant. Okay, still quite a few not raising their hand. And secondly, who honestly feels that their organisation is effectively managing cross-border issues or does have an effective framework? If those people can put their hands up. Okay, so quite considerably less, yes. Um, and, that, and that's why the panel decided to, to, to raise this as an issue because um, we do feel it's, it certainly is a risk and it is an issue that um, may not have been uh, really looked at by, by the community, um, not only in, in Dubai DIMC but elsewhere. Um, many of us have been in this room before and we've, we've attended sessions with the, with the DFSA and the DIFC and, and various law firms, but um, 
I'm, I'm not aware of too many sessions that really focused on, on, on a cross-border framework. And, I, and obviously I think it's very important to, to, to raise awareness of that. Um, the last thing you would want as a CEO or as a compliance officer would be to get a call from one of your colleagues, maybe at an airport, and maybe they've been apprehended by the authorities um, flying into to a, a particular jurisdiction to, to, to conduct a service. Um, that would be you know, all of our that worst nightmare. Um, certainly it might happen um, very infrequently, but there is always the potential of something like that to happen. Um, and I mean, cross-border is it, it's so important to, to us here in the DIMC because you've only got to just walk across the road and effectively you've got a, you've got a cross-border issue on your hand. I mean, the Middle East and the Gulf, um, a number of countries, all of them have their own regulations. A lot of them have set up a financial centers. Uh, more of them are being set up as we speak. Um, more and more the regulations are getting com complex. Um, I mean, I've been in the region for 10 years, and when I, when I was first here, um, you could really say that there, in a lot of aspects there was, there was very little regulation, and it really was. Uh, people could go to many places and market many different products, and really CEOs and, and boards could, could, could really say, okay, very little risk of um, any problems in relation to that. And I think you know, those days um, are gone. Uh, we've seen more and more regulations issued in, in this region. Um, even we, in this country, there's a proliferation of regulators now, even, even in the UAE. Um, and it's incumbent on boards to be sensitized to that, the CEOs to be sensitized to that, and compliance officers really play, play a key role in the relation to that. Um, from my own experience, um, I would agree with you here that uh, A is probably the most difficult challenge, but I probably wouldn't go as high as to say 72%. I, I am quite surprised that um, the other three categories did not did not rate higher. But certainly starting off um, in terms of the, the pillars you need to put in place for an effective cross-border framework, obviously you need to, to take the time to go out and understand what regulations apply um, in the various jurisdictions in which, you, in which your colleagues are offering services, marketing providing services. Um, and that's, that's not an easy task. Um, it, it can be costly, it can be very time consuming, you will need to um, more than likely engage with external counsel to, to get that information. You may need to have a meeting or a series of meetings with, with the regulators to, to, to understand, um, particularly when it's not clear. Um, and this, that can be a, um, a subject to be involved in terms of um, the particular products that you're marketing or the particular organisation background um, your organisation is from, in my experience. Uh, it's not easy, it is time consuming, but it, it has to be done. Um, and then it's not something that is static as well. So when you, you put together your reports, when you've gone out to external counsel, you've got advice in terms of this jurisdiction, these are the regulations, and it, it obviously doesn't stop there because things change and things can change very quickly. You need to regularly go out to council. You need to make sure you're engaging the right council to get the right advice. Um, do they really know the market? Are they talking to the regulator? Have they really interpreted the regulations correctly? Um, can your organisation rely on that um, before it's signed off? I mean, that's really important. Then secondly, I think the awareness is, is a really key factor as well. Um, no doubt for a lot of your, your colleagues, um, particularly if they're relationship managers or, or they're marketing, they will see this obviously as a big hindrance. You know, very few of them naturally will see it as a support. Um, they'll see it as um, another, another tick box exercise and another um, pain in the behind from compliance. Um, but you know, certainly they don't want to be in a situation where they get into hot water over an activity that they're conducting um, in a jurisdiction. And, it's your, and I think it's your jobs as um, whether you're supervisors or compliance officers or you are managing that there too to basically impart that message to, to make sure that they're aware, they're aware of how important it is. And that's when the training comes in. Um, again, it's very time consuming. It takes a lot of time to put, a, to put these training programs together. Um, but it's something that really has to be done. I would say that to be effective, the framework should have 
an element whereby people are adhering to that, um, they are affirming that they, they do understand this. I mean, a lot of it can be quite complicated, can be quite technical. And if you're looking at, um, say you have an office here that, that is, is traveling around to say six, six jurisdictions just in this region in the Gulf, um, you, you're looking at at least six different, uh, six different reports or papers in relation to the applicable regulations in all of those jurisdictions. And then obviously the permutations go up in terms of um, additional jurisdictions that they might be operating in. Um, then, then lastly, I think uh, the key sort of pillars I think is the monitoring, because it's not it's not enough just to to get the advice, to put these papers together, to to train people, and you really need to um, be confident and have a good feeling about whether people are really following this. Are, are people in your organization able to, to circumvent this? Are they able to get on a plane or email somebody or have a phone conversation about something without the cross-border framework covering that or management being aware or somebody signing off on it? So that's important to, to, to think about that as well. And again, um, there's time constraints involved in that, there are costs involved in that, and there may be system system related issues. How do, how do you systematize that? How do you make how do you operationalize that as well? Um, from from my experience, there are sort of three main sort of pillars I think that you would need for uh, a, uh, an effective cross border framework. I'd, I'd certainly like to 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 hear from you all in terms of your own experiences um, in, in the Q and A. Just what other elements you think is important. And uh, other than the 72% on knowledge and understanding, um, you know what other what other risks there are to making this effective. Thank you very much. And please can I just remind you that um, uh, on your screens you do have the opportunity to ask questions or send comments um, to the panel. So if uh, any questions do uh, arise to your comments or make in relation to what the speaker has just said, then do um, please um, pick them. Um, Lawrence, the viewpoint of the um, regulator on that does, uh, uh, and I'm particularly interested, you know, for my part, in what, from a UK perspective, we would find, I think, probably quite uh, unusual, which is the lack of harmonisation uh, and coordination, of course, in the context of um, the UK and the European Union, the various directives we've had over many years now. Um, has brought into harmony um, the um, various rules that operate. We have the host state, home state um, uh, regime uh, and obligations and uh, rights being um, pretty well um, equal across, um, across the community. Um, is there any obvious reason why we don't have that here, given that one assumes the principles um, are, are common to all the various jurisdictions that uh, um, uh, govern compliance officers. Yes, uh, so the, um, I think the uh, initial point I'd probably make is that um, when we're comparing um, UAE as a region um, to Europe, <coughs> excuse me, um, one's got to take the uh, opportunity to reflect on the fact that the region is still young. Um, uh, places such as Europe um, have now had quite a considerable period of time to work uh, between the countries to harmonise regulatory standards. Um, and, and within the UAE, for example, some of the other authorities are clearly um, improving and uh, focusing on international standards. And, and generally, as we see around the world, most countries now adopt international standards, whether they're banking, the Basel, um, IOSCO, the securities, and from IIS, the insurance standards, and respect of ag and matter. So in time, we would see more harmonisation of regulatory requirements, and we would expect to see the same here in the UAE. Um, and I think that's very important. Uh, if we talk about effective passporting, well, passporting can only happen when there's a, a clear harmonisation of regulatory requirements, that um, the regulators within neighbouring countries are able to rely on each other and have some sort of a trust of the regulatory standards, and the, the oversight there is equivalent. Um, We've been on some panels in the recent couple of months and um, we had heard discussion that, for example, the NIST attempts to look at some sort of GCC passporting. 
give it information, but again, that will take us a couple of years to sort of develop and, uh, uh, and come into force. Thank you very much. The um, two segments of the pie chart, 3% uh, each, were the sourcing and buying of um, uh, uh, senior management, and those two, in a sense, go hand in hand. Does that strike you as a, an interest in your experience? Would you say that that is what the um, uh, DFSA finds that it's, would it agree with that assessment of um, uh, 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 that the, there is sufficient resource in, you know, amongst the um, entities that you visit uh, and there is sufficient evidence of um, buying the senior management? Well, I can, I can only comment to obviously in relation to uh, our overall sort of uh, approach. Um, generally, we, we do uh, risk assessments of our individual firms, and as part of that process, uh, we do understand that there are, there are clearly some uh, challenges with cross border activities. Uh, part of the issue is, and it's difficult for the DFSA, um, uh, we're dealing with uh, regulations that are outside our control. When you talk about the federal law, well, that's a piece of legislation that wasn't written by the DFSA. So, we're taking a view as to what we understand and interpret um, the, that law to mean as far as, so what can you do on a day-to-day -day basis when you do activities in or from the DIFC and you go out and visit clients that are based in the UAE? Um, what's clear is that um, uh, senior management understand these issues, clearly the compliance officers understand these issues and um, they seek appropriate advice from compliance external people and, and law firms to try to assist them with this. But, it's still, a, it's still an area that's fairly grey. Um, it's clear that um, you can have clients outside the DIC and do business with those clients. Um, it's clear that obviously if you do all your business in the DIC, then that's clear. But what's grey is exactly how often you can go out and meet clients and conduct business in the, in the broader UAE. Uh, clearly, if you're going out into the broader UAE and holding marketing sessions and um, marketing particular products to clients, then you're going to face issues in respect to the local regulators' requirements of what they expect um, you to do, and, uh, and, and that is to be a licensed and, and comply with their requirements when doing business there. And, and the way we see that, that'd be no different to anywhere else in the world. If uh, you're based in, um, in, in Europe and you fly to the US, then you're going to have to comply with the local US requirements. Tony, if I could just um, jump in there. We've got a couple of questions from the yeah. audience, if I may put these uh, to the panel. Um, Ali from Arkan Partners says, high capital requirements and disjointed regulatory requirements across the GCC impede pan-regional asset management sales. What steps, if any, are being taken to address this by regulators themselves, given a substantial amount of regional assets continue to be invested outside of domestic markets? I can comment uh, on the respect of the DIC. I mean, uh, the DFSA did basically um, adopted the uh, prudential requirements set by the standard setters um, in Basel III. Um, and in respect of most of the firms that operate in the DIC, they're mainly branches. So we rely on the, the regulation that's been imposed by the home state regulator. So if that's a UK bank and they're coming through, then the uh, PRA will be the relevant body that uh, deals with that. Um, clearly, we obviously work with our other regulators within the region, and as I've said, uh, I think other regulators are slowly uh, um, implementing international standards as part of their regulatory framework. And, uh, and this is because most of these countries are also, like the UAE, subject to an FSAT assessment, where these standard setting bodies uh, through IMF and World Bank come and do assessments of those country regimes. So I think my answer probably would be with more harmonisation, then hopefully that will make it easier for um, uh, firms to do business and, and hold appropriate capital relevant to the activities they've done. And, and, and I may add to that, it's, it's, it, it's pretty illogical that it's still fragmented. Right? We should not forget that in this region, in the GC region, there's like six, seven, nine, twelve markets that are coming up. Um, and then compared to, for instance, London City or Singapore or Hong Kong, it's just beginning markets. And if you're the regulator in that market, now what do you do? Do you take like DRC, big step forward, uh, harmonize as much as possible with international law and rules. Or if you're regulated, do you stick with the local rules and regulations, your old central bank requirements, and you gradually move up it. So you will have these imbalances and imperfections. There's nothing to do about not that there is in the But these are a fact of life. 
what I believe is, is much more important is <coughs> identify where the gaps are. We once, uh, we once made a, a map of the Middle East um, where all countries, all financial jurisdictions, and what can you do in which jurisdiction if you're coming from another jurisdiction. <coughs> that was an interesting road map. Um, it started out when we made the first solution, was like uh, eight years ago. It was a blank sheet of paper. You couldn't do anything. Or you could do everything because nobody knew. At least it was time to learn to know what can you do if you're from the DRC, what can you do in, in, in Saudi. If you're a suitcase back in Switzerland, what can you do in the UAE? Uh, so it is evolving. Capital requirements, financial uh, nice service. You don't want to put some capital there. That's no, no, no big trick. That's no, no big secret. Thank you, Yuri. I have a further question. Um, what is the difference between a cross border framework and effective compliance? What is the difference between a cross border framework and effective compliance? <clears throat> My point that in, there's, there's little to no difference. I think to, for effective compliance, you need to factor in having a cross border framework that's effective. If you have um, people who are offering services on, on a cross border basis. A couple, a couple more questions have just come through. How can we practically manage a dialogue with the GCC regulators? What has happened to MOU utilization? Um, as far as MOUs, the uh, TTSA uh, continues to engage uh, strongly with our, um, firstly our regulators here in the UAE, um, the Central Bank of the UAE, um, the Securities Commodity Authority and the Insurance Authority. We have MOUs with those regulators. Um, you see from uh, the business plan, I think, that the FSA has issued recently, which is available on the iPad, that one of our key areas of focus in the next two years is to um, engage more with our regional uh, stakeholders and our regional regulators. Uh, as part of that, we would see um, uh, the, the need and eventual um, steps that we'll take to enter into MOUs with those particular regulators. We, we already have uh, MOUs with particular regulators in the GCC. We're, we're taking steps to um, uh, meet with other regulators. Uh, we, we do spend time now with Saudi and CMA and SAR and other regulators in, in that particular jurisdiction. And it's likely that we'll enter uh, into MOUs with those types of jurisdictions in due course. I have another question, if I may. To what degree have you observed regional regulators expressly confirm the nature or existence of tolerated practices? To what degree have you observed regional regulators expressly confirm the nature or existence of tolerated practices? Yeah, I think um, in, in our part of the world here, in, in the Middle East and in the Gulf, I think there, there have certainly been instances where regulators have um, acknowledged a tolerated practice. Um, it, there, are, there are instances on that. It's said, I'm, I'm just thinking of it from the you know, um, obviously UK perspective. Um, the, we have um, the, uh, the FCA handbook, which is subdivided into rules, guidance, and evidence. Uh, and then we have um, uh, what are sometimes referred to as dear CEO letters, i.e. warnings. Um, and there are consultation papers, or there is uh, um, uh, any legislation as regards the rule book. Um, and uh, because there's a statutory duty to um, consult, but one of the things you can't get um, the regulator to do is to give you a kind of watertight opinion, an answer to what the rule actually means. Um, they never have done that. The standard response is um, that's a matter for um, legal advice. You can take your lawyer's um, advice, and that's very much been the tradition um, or the practice, I should say, within the um, UK, right from the inception of um, financial services regulation. And please just give me one indication I don't know what the practice is from um, the US, the FSA, whether they take a similarly um, uh, restrictive view of the way that um, they will tell you what a rule actually means and give you some kind of cover. I think the, uh, the key issue with the, the tolerated practice, and I, let's say we'll use the, uh, devise the 
perfect example as far as what's tolerated by local regulators when you cross the border, um, cross Shakeside Road, and you do business outside there. I think when I first started the, um, the DIC and worked in the um, FSA seven, eight years ago, if I was at a conference like this and speaking to other people, I, I guess the, the view of what's tolerated is possibly uh, um, quite more open as to what it is now. And, and I think part of the change is clearly that the local regulators have become more. Um, uh, uh, sort of been taking more actions, first of all, to pass the regulatory standards that apply in those areas, and therefore are becoming more vigilant around what they expect to happen as far as when firms are going outside into the border to buy and doing business. So, as to what is tolerated practice, that's becoming a, a, um, possibly less tolerated, I guess, uh, uh, I'd probably say. But ultimately, that's a matter for those regulators um, and uh, how they go about supervising firms that do business out there and um, taking enforcement action. On the other hand, it's, it's a logical trend. Um, if I go back to what I, what I said earlier, um, on the global level, we see more and more regulation coming in, and the regulations becoming more and more complex. So then the idea of the notion of tolerated practices will automatically be reduced a little bit. If, if I have a company, I'm active in financial services, and I see more and more rules coming up, and I see more and more sanctions coming up, and then engage into a kind of tolerated activity, what do you do? You know, you're going to is this really tolerated? How do we get it confirmed? We go to the waters, we go to regulators. By that notion, you already start regulating it. You will do it all we have 100 petitions going into the DFSA about is this tolerated or not? What's the logical answer going to be from the regulator? Or let's regulate it. But it's a natural trend. Uh, I think I'd like to move on now to the second of our um, uh, subject areas, uh, which is conduct um, risk. And we have a question um, to put to um, to put to you on that, which um, Shiraz is going to um, set up for you now. So, if I can ask everyone to pick up their iPads, please. The question is: What are the key conduct risks for 2015? What are the key conduct risks for 2015? Is it a cyber risk? Is it b financial crime? Is it C, client classification? Is it D, suitability? Or is it E, financial promotions? If you could please cast your vote now. Yes. Um, uh, I suppose one, in one sense, um, could not disagree with the 35% rating for um, financial crime. Uh, in another sense, one might say, well, you should actually have captured the risk to a large degree in the context of that particular um, issue. Um, degree of, um, and, and I suppose, ditto um, client um, uh, classification. Uh, I think the thing that I am surprised there isn't a um, greater percentage um, uh, of um, assessment of risk for is, is cybercrime. Um, that I think is is new, obviously. Um, it's uh, um, it's insidious in a way that um, certainly other aspects of, of, of these risks. Uh, but it is one that we haven't, I think, had a lot of experience of dealing with. So I certainly don't want to downplay the importance of um, financial crime um, or suitability, but I wonder whether because we've had those as risks for so long uh, and are um, uh, equipping ourselves and we've got experience, um, uh, we've got knowledge um, or how we manage those, whether the bigger risk um, facing us is the new one. Um, but that's my view on things, I don't know. I think, um, John, uh, if you want to kick off um, our um, debate on this. Well, I, I, I do think you're, uh, you're right there, Tony. So it does surprise me that cyber risk didn't uh, feature more heavily. Um, but I think you might also be right that that's perhaps because it's a great unknown. Um, and one of the things that, that we're seeing is that organize, many organisations really, whilst they're aware that there is a risk out there, really haven't done much to bring it in-house 
and to look at um, their own systems, their own controls to make sure that they're, they're effectively uh, protected from that. So you hear, some, hear about some very large cases, um, you hear about some very large sanctions um, from of organisations, but it tends to be one of those problems that at the moment I think is, is someone else's problem. Um, the other, financial crime, I mean, I, I think Lawrence might talk a little bit more around the, the conduct risk. Um, it, it's a very broad topic, so it's a very broad answer is financial crime. Um, to some extent, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, there are some significant uh, developments, and I know the regulators, for instance, are looking fairly heavily at, um, at the risks around um, trade finance money laundering as a I don't, it's, I don't, I, I caution calling it a new phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that which is now elevated in its importance because as the preventive controls around um, your standard anti-money laundering or money laundering uh, improve, um, you start, to, well, criminals start to look at other ways of doing it. Trade finance has probably been used for many years as, as a means of money laundering but it's probably the next big avenue to try and, to try and cut off, except that it's extremely difficult to do that. Um, and I don't know, Lawrence, if you want to come on Yeah, sure. Um, well, I definitely think the uh, financial crime sort of a component there definitely reflects the, the fact that that continues to be an important area for both firms and definitely for the regulator um, here in the DRC, the DSA. Um, we, um, we, we definitely have that as one of our, continue to have that as one of our key regulatory priorities. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and as, as such, um, we will definitely be looking into uh, conducting thematic reviews in these particular areas. Uh, it's been about 18 months since we uh, introduced the revised AML module, which brought in to um, uh, our requirements the latest of the FATF uh, standards. And as part of that, we will be conducting a thematic review where we will be looking at how firms that apply a risk-based approach conducting AML um, and as you said trade finance is definitely one of the areas that we will be having a look at um, to assess how firms are going about uh, um, mitigating and managing some of the risks associated with uh, AML uh, and also uh, issues around general screening and sanctions compliance. Um, a couple of the other areas that we, we will look at uh, this year as well in financial crime is just areas around ongoing due diligence, just how firms are doing that and conducting that but also in respect of um, SARS. So is there a, a process internally for a firm to um, internally escalate suspicious activity? And then also what are the quality of those SARS when they're reported through to the AMS CU unit of the central bank? Um, the other areas are also areas that are, uh, are part of the DFSA's, I guess, uh, uh, conduct risk focus for 2015. Client classification um, still is an important area with recently brought in some regulatory changes uh, to our client classification definitions. But one area that we continue to focus on is for those firms that deal with individuals um, and how they go about assessing individuals as professional clients. Um, it's clearly not just looking at the net assets uh, of the particular individual, but has the firm uh, been able to do an assessment as to the knowledge and experience and understanding that the individual has of the products that are being sold by the particular firm. Um, in brief, um, you know, just because someone has a high net worth or um, has a lot of assets doesn't mean they're a sophisticated investor and they treat it as a, a professional client. Um, suitability um, goes hand in hand with that and that continues to be an area of uh, supervisory focus for us. We, we want to make sure that our firms are offering products and um, uh, services to a, a, an individual or a person that is suitable for um, that particular person. And, and therefore, you, the firm needs to look at the, the needs and objectives of the client, um, their financial situation, their knowledge, their experience and understanding of the products and, and the associated risks. Um, and financial promotions, again, um, it's poss possibly one I thought might have been a little bit higher uh, in respect of uh, uh, the issues. Um, most of the firms here in the DIC market products. And, and again, that's a, an area that we focus in in respect of uh, making sure the promotional material and the product information doesn't contain um, any misleading statements in respect of the particular products. Um, and finally, cyber risks. Uh, I think this is an issue that uh, is actually on the regulatory agenda of a lot of regulators around uh, the world at the moment and internationally. And uh, 
again, the area that we would expect firms to be able to have the processes to uh, address cyber risks, uh, in particular, uh, the ability to identify and respond to cyber incidents that happen at the firm. And, and the other key area as well is uh, what due diligence are firms doing when they're picking third party providers in respect to what cyber um, risks and protections are about to particular entity has. Uh, if, if I may add one thing to that, if, if, if I look at the whole thing, the cyber risk for us is, is, is a trend that we see incredibly uh, increasing. Uh, we see more and more attempts, but we also see a larger, uh, uh, thicker firewalls, bigger and bigger IT. What we see in our firm is that uh, more and more clients are not only increasing the security, uh, IT security in their own organization, but also in all kinds of service providers they do business with. Be it an SR firm, be it a payroll firm, be it a client firm, I think that, that's irrelevant. There are more and more institutes. These cyber guys, they can find backdoors anywhere they don't even know they really 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 exist. And, and the trend that we've seen is that the number of incidences is actually decreasing, but the impact of one hitting you is so incredibly large that it, it, can, it can just ruin the whole company in one go. Um, we've, we've, we've invested heavily in, 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 in increasing uh, that, that, that's, that IT risk, and, and the, the, the overlap is there. Thank you, Eric. Uh, just a quick question uh, that we've got from the audience. Um, can cyber risk be termed as a conduct risk? And if so, why? Okay, um, the, the way I sort of looked at cyber risk is um, um, cyber risk is really sort of a conduct risk and an operational risk. Um, um, and, and one of the issues we're just talking about then is uh, really whose responsibility is cyber risk as well. And um, the way I look at cyber risk is definitely part of uh, the government body is role to, to, to know and understand the cyber risks that uh, are there in the organisation and um, and therefore I do look at it as a, a type of conduct risk in that uh, uh, you know, uh, an organisation needs to have uh, an approach in how it's going to address cyber risk, needs to have training for its employees so they understand the, the risks in opening uh, documents and emails where malicious software and that can come. So clearly there's some operational risks that are involved with that, but also some conduct risks that maybe trying to label it as one or the other is not really the right issue, it's clearly a risk. I agree entirely that systems and controls are inevitably part of the conduct in the sense of that is how the organisation conducts um, its business. It's not conduct in the sense of fitness and propriety or how one drafts a um, financial promotion as such, but it is just how you run your business, which is sort of the, the underpin um, of, of conduct. It is uh, it's certainly in, Back home, we would regard that as a fundamental part of um, uh, compliance systems and controls. Do any of my panel members have any further comments uh, to make on that object? No further questions, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we can move on then, I think, to our um, other area of. Um, uh, hindrance or um, um, uh, support. Um, outsourcing. Um, I mentioned at the outset that uh, um, finding, securing good um, compliance support can be very, very difficult. Um, and sometimes the work has to be managed, particularly in a small firm, is by um, outsourcing. And it can sometimes be a, you know, a clash um, between what the regulator um, regards as being what the outsourcer has to, or the outsourcee has to have, um, and the um, company. Um, and certain issues that would um, cross my mind uh, relate where you have perhaps a, um, an outsourced entity, an outsourced um, function which is shared by the outsourced compliance person in relation to one uh, um, entity, but I also uh, am the outsourced compliance um, function for another entity and for yet another entity, and how that works together in the context of confidentiality and the risks there are in relation to breach of confidentiality or conflict um, of interest. Um, what happens, uh, suppose, you, having outsourced a particular function, 
um, uh, quite happy with the service you're getting, but somewhere along the line amongst um, uh, entities that have outsourced the function to that very same company or individual, and they've found a big problem. Uh, how do you get to know about it? Do you get to know about it? Should you get to um, know about it? And if so, what should the machinery for um, doing that be? Um, I think we have a question on that, don't we? We do indeed. Um, so the fourth and final question is, what is the biggest regulatory burden? What is the biggest regulatory burden? Is it A, increased compliance costs? Is it B, lack of harmonization? Is it C, proliferation of regulation? Or is it D, complexity of new regulations? Could you please cast your vote now? Yes, I'm seeing a pattern here clearly, aren't we? Um, unsurprisingly. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, this ground, I think, here um, that we've um, travelled um, before, it's interesting to see that increased compliance costs um, uh, is at well, the lowest level on that um, chart, um, which I uh, I don't know whether that should be encouraging, whether one would say, well, um, we're all getting it right because we're spending a lot of money on it, um, or it's just not something they're worried about. And I, I hope it's um, the, the former. Um, uh, I'm going to, as this is essentially going to be about outsourcing some of the themes that I mentioned a little while ago, I'm going to hand over to Yuri to. Um, Find out what his comments are in relation to the issues. I know this confidentiality conflict is an outsourcer, really, someone who knows the business, sort of uh, runs through the veins of the business, as I think one um, might say. Um, and then to you. Well, thank you. Um, if you look at outsourcing, um, if the outsourcing you started out with, uh, and maybe even on the sense of our student risk report, um, I'm mentioning part of one of the firms that does the outsourcing. If I was you, outsourcing compliance and AML, I wouldn't do it. I just wouldn't do it. But if you look at outsourcing in the traditional way of the world, you take part of your responsibilities, your liabilities, and your know how you export it to a third company. You can make the most detailed reports in the world uh, 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 and contractual obligations, and you have, are absolutely fluid in what they do. I've done outsourcing for hundreds of millions in IT, and it was a disaster, and we lost money with it. If I was you, I would outsource. If I were you, what I would do is insource. And it depends a lot on the delivery model of the way you go about it. If you just give your liabilities and your resources and your know how away, and somebody else in a different location, God knows where, is working on your vital information, I would be very, very nervous. On the other hand, if you look at um, uh, the certain risk, the liabilities, we've set it up in such a way that it's not our firm that's the outsourcing firm. It is our individual, our consultant, with a lot of know-how, who's basically becoming a part-time uh, uh, compliance officer in your firm. So if, if you're sitting there, you're like, I don't need a full-time compliance officer. These guys here, they've set up all the rules and regulations. When you have to do all this, it's maybe one day per week, and four days in a week, he's not allowed to do anything else. So why not hire a part-time consultant or a part-time uh, compliance officer? Part-time work doesn't really work, doesn't really exist out here. So what have we done? We basically we take one guy, and he has five, six years of experience as a new one. And we'll put him with a, a bank on, on day one. It is that individual who will be approved by the regulator, and it is his personal line uh, and name that is the offer us in the room. Meaning that the firm in itself who has to uh, establish if, if the individual is fit and proper, it doesn't really matter if you're hiring directly or if you get it through, uh, the name is outsourcing, but we call it insourcing. Uh, if you get a part-time guy in through one of the agencies. The second thing is, the regulator must also establish if this person is uh, fit and proper. That's why it's called an authorized individual. Uh, if the guy has been tested by, um, how do I call it, by the firm itself, if he's been approved by the regulator, and the liabilities are both contractually covered and they're covered in the law and in the rules and regulations of the DOJ, I think that liability and risk is more or less covered. But the other thing I wanted to address is, if we go back a few ounces, 
and it's probably a coincidence, but the same pattern is there. When we, when we had the question on the cross-border issue, I don't know if anybody noticed, but roughly 30% uh, or 70% said it's a big headache for us. 30% did not. Now, it might be a sheer coincidence, but 30% of the regulated companies uh, in, in, uh, in the years have outsourced by external counsel or uh, external guidance on this. And, and, and I go back to the question of know-how. Let's assume you're a big company with, with a, a, a huge compliance organization. You've got to know how in house. If you're slightly small, if let's say you're a bank from Switzerland, you have a local bank here and one like that, and your people want to do business in the entire region, you have one compliance officer. It's impossible for one compliance officer to know all the rules and regulations of all the surrounding countries. In, in the UAE alone, there's four or five regulators. If you look at the entire GCC region, including the world, there's about 25 regulators. There's 25 different rules. Nobody can know it. If you deal with an in-source compliance group, well, we mix up in-house delivery uh, uh, and, and know-how and team. And we carry a team of 14 uh, uh, consultants. All of them are experts on the DSA, but they all have the sub expertise. One guy knows everything about uh, uh, KSA, the other one about Kuwait, uh, uh, somebody knows everything about um, um, KYC. So you basically buy one part-time company also, and you get to know our 14. So the, the, the intellectual property becomes yours. It becomes incorporated into your, and basically it is available like a little library. And so these, these risks that you're, you're mentioning, yes, if you're outsourcing in a traditional way, those risks are really life environment, and I would never do it. If you're insourced, it might be a very smart idea, not just for economic reasons, but also for know it seems like this is quite a hot topic because I've got quite a number of uh, questions coming through. So uh, if I could just put these to the panel. Uh, should there be a limit on the number of firms that an outsourced compliance officer can service? It's an old event. Um, we started this uh, with the, the, BFZ, uh, the BIFC celebrated its 10th anniversary uh, last July, and we celebrated <coughs> it uh, last October. Um, and for 10 years we've been hearing this argument. I can understand that there's a certain trend, I say, like the regulator wants to make sure, and I, I agree on that, that the compliance officer is not burdened with too much that he has spare capacity that if something happens with client A, this time available, they can go to client B. If you want to specify that in the number of clients, I'm not so sure. If you look at category four, small, um, one experienced guy could do much more than five. Um, but I would never give five category three companies to one consultant. That's too much. It's, it's a balance. I think that uh, you know, it, it's, that's quite interesting. I, just to have a numerical limitation just strikes me as too simplistic. Yes. Uh, you, you could have, um, and ultimately the DFSA would have to take a judgment call on whether an, 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 an individual um, was servicing too many companies. But you can understand the position where there is a specific type of company dealing with a specific type of issue where the fact that you have a, an outsourced compliance officer um, is, and it's just doing that kind of entity, just doing that type of um, uh, business, um, one can see value in that. And one can't automatically see the reason why there should be a numerical limitation. I think another point, uh, it seems to me, is that um, a kind of roving compliance officer. And I've always felt um, that the regulators don't really like it terribly much. Um, that's the impression I have um, in the UK, but realize there is no alternative uh, for small businesses. Um, but what a um, roving compliance officer can bring um, is a perception of what is best practice in the area uh, in which he is acting as. Um, Officers. So it's not it's not all downside. I mean, it, I think the, the, there has to be some sophisticated thought behind it, um, and I don't think just a numerical limitation is uh, is is rationally justifiable um, uh, or good for the industry. Yeah. Okay, just to add, um, from the DSA's perspective, we haven't actually set a particular number. And part of that issue is that 
we also understand it's actually the firm's obligation to do due diligence on the service provider and the compliance officer to assess um, what their responsibilities are as well. Um, and as uh, Vera was saying, um, there are a lot of staff that here that do very little business in their first 12 to 18 months of operations, such that you could have a compliance officer uh, acting for a handful of firms. Um, um, and that's what we generally see. Um, obviously, as the firms grow and their business grows, then there's um, issues that are there for the firm. And the firm needs to ensure that that compliance officer has, a, has adequate resources to be able to um, comply with its function. So we definitely take a view of putting the obligation on the firm. But we do generally monitor um, uh, across the service providers that we that we have how many compliance officers there are and how many firms that they're acting in. We can share information with your supervision between the different relationship managers if concerns arise. I think that's, it, that's terribly important. This, what, what is the role and the responsibilities? I, I don't particularly like the phrases of part time compliance or even roving compliance officer because I mean, I, I, one of the critical functions from my perspective of, of compliance within the organisation is that it starts to embed itself within the culture. Um, and as soon as you start talking about part-time, how, how can that then be embedded within the culture of the organisation? I mean, you're in, and I, <laughs> this is not a critique. It, no, no. It is, it is, it, it's a tension that's there because if, if you do only have a resource that is available on a part-time basis, how do you make sure that the allocation of that time also deals not with just the day-to-day -day activities, but also helping to embed a compliance culture within the organisation? And that's where you have to be careful to make sure sufficient time is devoted to that element of it, and not just ensuring that the, the, the record keeping and, and the ongoing monitoring is up to date. You touched on one of the most valid points. Um, and, and here's how it works, at least in my view. If, if you just outsource the technical part, yeah, somebody coming in, sitting in the form and then leaving it, that is not the most exciting job in the world. And it's, it's boring and you can hire anybody to do that. It's not that difficult. What becomes difficult is um, uh, for our individuals, and on one day uh, they work with bank A, which has a certain culture, and on the other day it's with bank B. Now, how do you fix this? First of all, um, we don't work like, uh, there's a lot of lawyers here, so I have to be very, very careful. Uh, and with Bill Barber and all this stuff, I simply refuse to do it. We want our people to be part of, of the team of the client, which basically is that most of our clients, they take our guy and bring him to the head office for three days or for five days or for a week to do the internal compliance training. We ensure, and, and for us it's like a critical risk if somebody doesn't want to comply with that, to do, then we don't want to have to find that we insist that our compliance officer who is on the job with is always the same one, not only reports to the SEO of it, but that he reports into the group compliance function as if he was one of their own. Um, we, we make sure that he takes the, 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 the internal courses, etc. etc. So it is, yeah, if you don't need full time, you hire part time. Um, and then the other risk I wanted to, to talk, talk about is. Um, we, we said confidentiality and we talk conflict of interest. If you talk about conflict of interest, it's a huge concern. If I was one of you and you would insure the guy for me, I would want to know who else insured it. I would not terribly be the best if my compliance officer for Monday happens to be the compliance officer for my biggest competitor on Tuesday. That's a very easy way to solve it. We forward this guy in, we let you know what, what clients he's serving, we have an objection, we don't do it. The reverse advice as well. And I know this is if I could just put another question uh, to the panel. Um, an outsourced compliance officer assumes personal liability by being an authorised individual, but what is the liability of the company? That is very simple. He's my employee, legally he's my employee, so basically he's under our responsibility as well. It's a little bit of a split the way I, I view it is. Uh, in Europe, with flexibility in labor is it's more common, where you split up the legal employer of record and the functional employer of record. So I got this with you, you're the functional employer of record. He had carries the, the liability as an authorized individual. The firm uh, uh, carries the uh, fifth and proper liability towards the DFZ. 
But us, as the legal employer, and advising him, and training him, and teaching him, etc., we carry the legal responsibility. If my if, if our people do that, then uh, who goes bankrupt? Me. I don't know why Can I just um, add to that? I suspect it might be a point that Lawrence would make is that if a compliance officer uh, made a mistake, a serious mistake, I, as regulator, would be asking the company. What steps did you take to ensure that um, the compliance officer had been uh, reasonably scrutinised um, before he was taken on? Um, and this goes, I think, to a point that John made um, that he was supervised. And this is one of the th points I, I think is, is a bit of a tectonic plate in um, outsourcing and, and, and part timing, as, as, as it's been referred to. Is, who actually is going to be the effective supervisor? Make sure that um, in, in substance, um, rather than just in the um, box ticking, um, that um, compliance individual is going to be doing his job properly. And I, I can I sympathise to some extent with Yuri saying, well, we as the employee um, and outsourcing <coughs> organisation will ensure that um, he or she is, is fully equipped. But once you get into that business, and if you're in several businesses, um, how is that, you know, the companies, as opposed to you as companies, but the authorised entities, um, obligation um, to have in place those systems um, going to be satisfied? Certainly that would be the questions I would be asking as, as the regulator. I don't know. I probably got them wrong, but... <laughs> no, it's uh, definitely uh, it's an important issue. I mean, the other way that we look at it as well is, um, ultimately, it's the, the governing body and senior management's responsibility for compliance within the firm. Um, the outsourced officer is an authorised individual and therefore has obligations, but ultimately the responsibility is on the firm to ensure that it complies with the state's obligations. Um, uh, you can outsource the function, but you can never outsource the responsibility. And I guess that's the, the real uh, key message that we tend to take away from this. Um, in respect to the, the service provider companies themselves, um, we don't regulate the company, we obviously regulate the individuals, but if the company, for example, is based here in the DIC, they'll have obligations under the company's law um, as far as uh, duties, um, but also they'll have data protection requirements imposed on them. Uh, as a result of the data protection law. So there are other uh, regulatory hooks, I guess, in respect of service providers that are based in the DRC. Well, a couple of years ago, there was this discussion like, should the service providers be regulated in uh, It may sound weird, but I, I, I would say yes. Uh, it doesn't fit in the model of, uh, of allocated liability, so it, it will not happen. Uh, but, but I would be a, a big, big yes. And, and the reason why is, if, if I were you, AS, and you consider this outsourcing, uh, there's, there's plenty of shops around often, but um, I've been very careful that the kind of shops is the vulnerability and continuity risk uh, that gets there. Um, I think it's not just an economical way. Uh, it's just the numbers are there and the costs are there, etc., etc. Uh, but it's also what do you get? If you get know-how of, of 15 people, uh, that's a lot. <coughs> Yeah, as we, as we dis, uh, discussed, um, I mean, the firm has to do due diligence on um, the selection of the compliance officer from the service provider, but um, that particular individual has to apply to the DSA to become an authorised individual, um, and therefore we will assess that particular person's fitness and propriety uh, and make a decision. Uh, this may involve having discussions with the person as well, uh, especially if they're new to our jurisdiction um, um, and taking on a role for the first time. And, and the other thing that happens a lot is, um, and first of all, you, when you get somebody new, there's also firms that get somebody in with an outstanding compliance officer, knows the business, knows the whole firm, but doesn't know the region yet. Uh, and we, we quite often we refer it as hand holding or mentoring, whereby then it's said, like, okay, you have your own compliance officer, he is very good, but he doesn't know the local rules yet, um, mentor or on the job training or uh, we call it hand holding. Uh, for three to six months, we have a look again and then uh, split up. And that's, that's a nice goal. It, it serves the regulators' need, it serves clients' need.
One further question, uh, if there is a sanction on an entity in a country, will it make the country high risk for compliance purposes? Yes. If there is a sanction on an entity in a country, will it make that country high risk for compliance purposes? And then the whole world will be high risk. There's another country in the world by another sanction will issue. Yeah, obviously as part of uh, looking at your uh, AML risk assessment, you've got to look at country risk. And um, as part of country risk, you'll, you'll look at a range of things, um, where the sanctions have been applied, whether they're on a particular list, um, FATFAS, for example, you've got the corruption index as well. So there are a number of uh, metrics that you can use to assess uh, the country risk, uh, uh, the fact that the country is subject to UN sanctions, for example, uh, is likely to mean that your overall view of that country risk uh, uh, is going to be higher. It doesn't mean that always a, every country will be a high risk, but uh, um, you definitely have to take that into consideration. Thank you. Um, I've got quite a number of questions on this topic, so if I may just slide yes, them across. Yeah. Um, what do you think are the three key factors in ensuring compliance? John? Um, well, knowledge, uh, knowledge, knowledge and experience. Yes. State of mind. Uh, yeah. Thank you, here. State of mind. Um, and uh, an ability to bring the right culture and mindset into the organisation. Well, that might be a little piece of state of mind, but there's individual state of mind and also the ability to promote it within the organisation because at the end of the day it's not just a compliance officer, it's the users of compliance that needs to get the message. Could I add um, uh, one share as, and that is dialogue with the regulator. Um, uh, key to ensuring compliance is knowing what the regulator wants, what, um, what the regulator's mindset is, uh, and having the trust of the regulator. Now, the regulator, of course, has a public duty, statutory duties, and the UK, I'm sure they're the same here. Um, but we're all human, and if I know that um, X is uh, in a company that takes its compliance responsibilities seriously, has systems in place, asks the right questions, is prepared to talk to me, um, I think that um, uh, just not necessarily in relation to the interpretation of a particular rule, but ensuring that the regulator knows um, that you are, going back to the ethos point, a company which has compliance at the centre of its business. Risk um, has come before profit. Um, and um, so I would add that as a, as a key part of ensuring compliance. It's funny, nobody mentioned uh, management bias. Yeah. That's, 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 that's surprising. Um, and, and I think, personally, I think that's one of the, the key issues. Because if you look at compliance, here's the boundary between what's legal and what's not legal. There's a margin there where top management of a firm should be done. This is how close we want to sell, no further than that. And then compliance, and that's filling out all the forms, that's the hindrance part, what's the support part, that is where Compliance duty is to take the organization as close to that borderline as management wants, but not cross it. So management buying is one of the three critical factors I'm looking at. Peter, I have a question for you, if I may. What do you think are the key limitations to compliance? The key limitations to compliance would be, um, I mean, there's probably always a challenge around resourcing, you know, having enough people. Um, we we talked today. I mean, a lot of the feedbacks about about the complexity of regulations, new regulations coming out. Ross well, used a term about um, last year was the, the acronym you know, about FATCA coming out and um, all the rest of it. But the the budget does not seem to be increasing for compliance personnel. Um, there's still very much headcounts in terms of compliance. Organisations are not willing to to let compliance teams get um, get too big. Uh, so I think that's that, that, that's a limitation on on the ability of the compliance profession to um, to to really aim to to really mitigate all the risks as, as best it, as best it can. Yeah, I want to. You mentioned about the, the, the proper people. 
It's, it's very interesting. In, in banks, what we what always been happening is uh, a bank buys a team of private bankers from another bank, and the clients come along. What we've seen lately a few times, and not in this reason, but in, in, in parts in Europe, but basically one bank was buying a compliance team from another bank. That was surprising. Mm -hmm. But why did they do it? <coughs> it was for the reason. That bank was successful, they did it. And they just bought the whole team. Now imagine that would happen to you. Please have a headache. <laughs> Uh, next question, do you think effective corporate governance and compliance go hand in hand? Yes, yeah, most definitely. And I think that getting, getting back to the point about um, you know, one of the three key elements of effective compliance, I would say along with management buying, you need to have a, a strong corporate governance as well, which goes hand in hand with, um, with management buying. Okay. Um, further question, aside from increased regulation or sanctions, how do you think we can encourage further transparency and compliance across businesses in the Middle East? Aside from increased regulation or sanctions, how do you think we can encourage further transparency and compliance across businesses in the Middle East? I would say that in the Middle East, a key challenge is, um, is corporate governance. I mean, a lot of, I mean, traditionally, a lot of businesses are uh, in private hands. Um, as opposed to other parts of the world where all the businesses have gone on, on public and that type of thing. I mean, there is a shift hitting that way. But um, given that a lot of business is in, in private hands, a very small number of private hands and families and all the rest of it, that um, does create some challenges in terms of transparency and sort of openness and all the rest of it. I think the transparency is, is also part of our uh, share. There's, there's a big culture. Um, in a previous life, I, I used to be a part of it. Uh, and, and there is like, you make a mistake, you share the mistake with the others, no matter how stupid the mistake was, because the other one would not make the same mistake, and then you would stay alive on it. I was trying to find it. If you look at this community, if you make a mistake, what we all try to do? Hide, dark, and especially don't tell another one, because you might get caught. One of the transparency issues is, uh, and it's going to be a very slow process, and it ties into the, to the state of mind, and even let's start with one single corporation. Transparency is about learning. Transparency is not about glory, look at me, I've done great. Yeah, you can be transparent in that and it's pretty much useless. Um, transparency becomes beneficial to a company when people or departments are willing and able to share what they've done wrong or what went wrong or in hindsight we should have done different, that's a more polite way of doing it, um, and share it with others. And that's a, a, a starting point in transparency. And I'm a big effort at it. I'm, I'm conscious of time and uh, we've got probably another 20 questions on outsourcing, so um, I, I'll try and go I'll through, I'll I'll try and so go through them as quickly as I can. Take three more. Yes, take three more. Um, can, uh, this is for um, Lawrence. Continued approval by DFSA of compliance outsourcing means they are not pushing for the development of individual skills for in-house compliance officers. What is the DFSA's perspective on this? I think our perspective is, uh, as I've mentioned, is that we generally put the obligations on the firm to make sure that they have adequate compliance arrangements in place. Uh, as a firm um, grows its business uh, and we see particular risks that evolve, we can, we can assess and discuss with the firm whether the, the compliance function using an outsourced uh, compliance officer and, and the adequacy of those arrangements are appropriate. But um, we have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis and, uh, and make that particular assessment. Um, and ultimately, it's really for senior management to, to really appreciate what other compliance risks and its uh, resourcing that's needed for, for that particular firm's activities. Great, thank you. Um, a further question. Is the assessment of a compliance officer by the DFSA from an outsourcing firm different from that of an assessment uh, of a CEO from a company hiring one in house? No, the, uh, the process is uh, exactly the same. Uh, we, we have a process to uh, approve and authorise individual, whether that's a compliance officer for an internal, either with a firm or from a, an outsourced service provider. We, we go through the same processes as, as, uh, as far as our assessment with that individual's fit the proper. Um, one final question that we'll take um, in relation to outsourcing. Will the introduction of FATCA regulations result in an amendment in general conduct of business at DSA? Well, um, first point I'll probably make in respect of FATCA, um, I mean, we're, we as the DSA, we're not the regulator for, for tax purposes uh, here in the DIC. Um, 
Uh, obviously, uh, as far as FACTA is concerned, there's obligations on firms to report in respect to FACTA. And um, as part of the DIC, we entered into an MOU with the Ministry of Finance, who's the, 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 I guess, the authority uh, in the UAE for the purposes of FACTA requests. And as a result of that, uh, the DIC made amendments to its legislation and the company's law such that the register of companies now will be the, the relevant body for the purposes of tax information requests of, uh, and any uh, reporting that's re required for FACTA purposes. So it's the, the registrar of companies will be the key uh, uh, gateway, I, I guess, as far as tax information requests. That's it? Good. Um, I'm going to draw the session to a close now. All I'd say just by a general comment is that in any um, a panel like this that I've been involved, it's usually the regulator's representative that gets the most pounding from the audience, and this is really no exception, but um, uh, um, Lawrence has had other questions um, magnificently, as have my other members, um, John Wilkinson, um, Peter Brady, and Yuri De Vries. So I'll draw the session to a close uh, and ask you to show your appreciation to members of the panel in the usual way. Thank you. If I could just ask everyone to please uh, take a moment to fill in the feedback forms which should have come up on your screens. That would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. <laughs>